Hey, y'all. I am so happy that you have joined me today because we need to talk. So make sure y'all like the video as the intro plays and make sure you leave any comments in the comment section or any questions that you might have. I am Paige, Dr. Shanta. I am the, the doctor. And I am a licensed clinical psychologist. Yeah. Welcome to the Paging Dr. Shonda podcast, all things related to the black culture. The doctor in front of your name. Period. They say you got the doctor in front of your name. I love my intro. <laughs> Shout out to the folks who made my intro. And that actually is like clips from previous podcast episodes. That was from, a, um, I think uh, Anthony O'Neill was saying that, oh, you got the doctor in front of your name. And they ended up using that as a soundbite. So really dope. Again, thanks y'all for coming back to my channel. And we have some things to talk about. I've been getting hit up uh, via DM and also text message because people were asking like, okay, what are your thoughts on this whole interview? What's your, what's going on? Like, what are your thoughts on Amanda Seals? What are your thoughts on Club Shay Shay? Blah, 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 da, 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 da. And y'all, I am here. The reality is I wanted to do this video a little bit earlier because, um, it was just like in the moment and I had so many thoughts, but I couldn't because I was doing like back to back travel for speaking gigs in April. And then I ended up getting sick for a week because I think it was like all the travel. And then the following week I ended up going out the country, but your girl was back. I'm here and that's all that matters. So we're going to relish in that. I know y'all missed me, but you know, I'm here. Uh, okay. So we're going to hop right into things. And like I said, as you guys have questions, feel free to put them in the comments section because I love to answer y'all questions, uh, whether it's via TikTok or if I'll do another video or whatever, um, all depending on what you guys ask. But we are talking about Amanda Seals on Club Shay Shay. Y'all have had so many think pieces, so many uh, things to say. I actually did a video over the weekend about how like people don't like Amanda Seals. And um, a lot of time that's indicative of how they feel about black women. And a lot of y'all didn't like that I said that. And I'm just like, I'm not saying anything different than what Malcolm X said. Malcolm X said that the black woman is the most uh, disrespected a uh, person in America like so we I don't I don't think that what I said was that controversial but I do believe that individuals who say that they don't like Amanda anytime I ask people so like okay why don't you like her I never get a real response like it's always like oh I don't I don't like her how she comes off I don't like her her tone I don't like da 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 like it is never a real reason and like I said on my TikTok like look if this lady stole your man, if she kicked your dog, if she stole food out your house, if she like stole your job, like if she did something to you, like you have every reason to not bang with her. But to say y'all don't like somebody because of how they come off, I think it's just giving a little um, very weird. So we're going to hop into things. We're going to talk more about this uh, interview. Before I get into the details and the nitty, the nitty gritty, I want to encourage y'all to listen to this um, show from an open perspective. So if we can kind of take away any biases that you have about her or any preconce preconceived notions that you might have about her prior to uh, the interview or, or even after the interview, I just ask that you remove those and just kind of like listen to this interview with a clear mind, a clear head, um, because I want to kind of challenge the way a lot of us are thinking about her in general and also her overall on the uh, interview on Club Shay Shay. Pop into things. And I'm over here looking at my notes because I, you know, I don't have everything up here in the noggin. I want to say this. I am not in agreement with how uh, black owned media uh, or even not just black owned, but black centered media, because some of these outlets are not black owned. Uh, black centered media has uh, come at this girl. Like it was literally like a dog pile. It was literally a dog pile on how, uh, oh, she, she cares about being likes more than blah, 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 or, um, you know, she's just not a likable person, like all these op-eds. And, and let me also say, just because a publication approves an op-ed, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is the, how the publication feels about that person, right? Because some people were saying like, oh, well, how did uh, this publication comment on her post, but they also published this article? Well, a lot of times people who write op-eds, yeah, it's approved by the editors, but also like it doesn't reflect the opinion of the overall publication. So I just wanted to make that clear. But also, I think that that's an even bigger question. Like, what are we doing about um, like some of these people who write op eds and like some of these editors? Are we giving them specific guidelines, things that they that should be published, things that shouldn't be published? And if we're not publishing certain things, are we censoring people and taking away their their freedom of speech? So um, I don't know. I would love to hear y'all's thoughts on it. But I, I think that when we uh, go into that territory of like censoring folks, I, I think it leads to 
bigger conversation. So um, I'm appreciative of diversity of thought, but also not when it's harmful to other people. And what we can say is that those publications and the things that were published in those uh, magazine outlets, uh, some of them being the Grio, uh, Essence was one, um, I think The Root, like it was a few others, but those are the main ones. <laughs> Excuse me, y'all. <clears throat> I told y'all I'm getting over a sickness. Um, but I do think that um, some of that was like very harmful. And she actually alluded to this in, a, in the interview where she talked about how like having so many people come at her um, and saying oh, she's not likable, she's not like, like, why am I here? Like if we hear someone expressing like thoughts of uh, suicidality, basically SI, uh, whether it's passive or, or, or active or whatever, like why would we continue to add on to that? And for real, for real, I feel like a lot of the, um, as a creative, as a, a writer as well, I also write uh, for different publications and such, but as a writer, um, people know what's clickbait. People know what'll get them, uh, what, what'll garner attention or like help to set off their career or whatever. I think that a lot of people selfishly utilize that moment to set off their own career which is trash. It's very much trash. And the one thing that I'm going, I always, you know, said to myself, look, if, if I'm going to be in this, uh, like writing space, I'm always going to be integral. I'm not going to write just to write, write just for clicks. I'm going to write because I want other people to be enlightened and I want to help other people. I want to be able to educate, right? It's never going to be about coming at someone, um, personally, I might critique behaviors. I might critique uh, statements or whatever, but I'm not going to say things about someone's likability uh, because I, I think that overall that's just trash. So yes, it was very much trash that so a lot of these publications did um, allow some of this. I will say that it hurt me as a black woman to see another black woman um, being just like come for like that in the media to the point where, again, like as a, a writer, I always like to present other people like various ways of, or different ways of thinking about situations and challenge their own belief systems. And so I, I um, proposed writing an article and I included Amanda Sales as well as like a few other black women who were being criticized in the media and talking about how this is a result of gendered racism. And um, oftentimes when black women are scrutinized publicly or held to a higher standard. Like, oh, this is not coincidental. Uh, we're actually seeing this with Marilyn um, Mobley, I believe. Please don't uh, don't come at me if I messed up her name, but I'm gonna do a whole nother video on her as well. But like, this is just a pattern. Like this happens to black women and it's not okay. And it's also not okay when it comes from our own. And um, yeah, so I, I ended up writing an article about this. I proposed it to a few publications, similar publications to the one that actually produced the uh, ones that were speaking negatively about her and nobody picked it up which I thought was extremely weird nobody picked it up I was planning to write an article pretty much um you know talking about how wrong this was and to really like encourage the black women who are in the lines of fire and this such as the Amanda Seals such as the Fannie Willis's um like I, I planned on doing that and nobody picked it up uh which I thought was extremely interesting and I, I think it I honestly think a part of me feels like um, some of this was people wanting to save face and just like holding off on how much content they were pushing on her because at that point she had already pushed back on it. Um, but I will say like I, I tried, I tried and uh, my trials were met with um, rejection. So uh, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and move on. I do plan to continue to, to um, push that to other publications though, because I do think it's something enlightening, but also if it's not pushed in another publication, don't forget y'all that I have the psychology of black women. The psychology of black women is a class that is taught by an online class taught by yours truly, Dr. Shonda, where I break down how uh, the, the things that black women experience on a day to day impact our mental health. And we specifically deep dive into depression and anxiety. We also talk about how to combat it from an African centered perspective. So uh, you guys will see the QR code above. So you guys can register for that. Our next class will be May the 23rd. So make sure that you are on the lookout for that. All right. So I'm going to hop into my thoughts on this overall interview. So first things first, I will say, I don't know if uh, Club Shay Shay was the platform for to have the, the discussion that she wanted to have. So if we're going to talk about very uh, astute, uh, culturally informed things such as racism, such as inequality, gender-based inequality, racism. Like if we're going to talk about these things, or we're going to talk about autism, uh, you know, different things like that. I think that we have to vet uh, the, the different platforms that we go on. Um, so a lot of people reach out to me 
to ask me to, you know, can you come on? Can you talk about X, Y, or Z? I do thorough research or I have people around me to do thorough research um, to see like, okay, do our values align? Is this, do we think this is going to clash? And ultimately, if it doesn't feel right in my spirit, I just don't go with it because I know that um, if I do do the interview, I'll probably leave more frustrated than I came. And I, that's never the goal. And so when we're having conversations about like race and, you know, all these things that she wanted to, to talk about. Again, I don't know if um, Club Shay Shay was a platform for that. I, I can think of various podcasts and shows that would have been great for this these types of topics, aka <laughs> paging Dr. Shonda. Um, but, and also others, like I have a lot of friends who are in this space who talk about things like this and um, they, you know, they, they, they do a great job holding space for conversations. And I, I think that when we're, our goal is to like share information about stuff like this and to have intellectual conversations. Honestly, I think, you know, having this con conversing with another intellectual will have probably been more beneficial. Um, I love Uncle Shay Shay. I love Club Shay Shay or whatever. But I would go to him if I was, you know, I just want to bust it up. I just want to like, you know, have conversations about life, things happening in pop culture. That's what I would go for. I wouldn't necessarily go if I had some like really serious things that I wanted to talk about because I know he probably would not be the person to um, can have that conversation about. And I'll, I'll talk more about that later. So, so yeah, so I don't think that this was the appropriate platform. For instance, look, this brings me to my first point that I wanted to highlight. There were some viral clips going on where Amanda Seals was talking about her experience, her lived experience and growing up in Florida and experiencing the racism that she had um, experienced as a child. She said there was one experience where she was at Nickelodeon and some of the other kids were being very racist. There was another incident where as a student, where she would uh, talk to her teacher or whatever. And her teacher said that this was like, she was identified as problematic. Even though she was doing her work, she wasn't disruptive. She was problematic for sharing information with that teacher. And while I do believe that there was some truth in what Uncle Shay Shay said about the teacher. So in certain, especially if we talking about down South, and I think it's weird sometimes, a lot of things that, you know, people in general wouldn't think it's disrespect it's deemed as disrespectful down south and so that could have been one of those things like a, a child you know providing information to a teacher a teacher might feel like oh you know who, who are you like it, it might challenge their ego in a sense uh but granted i'm the school of thought like i'm not here for your ego beloved i'm here to learn <laughs> like as a student like it's not my business if you were offended by that um but also you know i do think that even if that was the case I think that her being a black girl was also a, a part of that. That was also uh, something that the teacher probably had an issue with or or not probably. It was something that the teacher had an issue with. In addition to that, Club Shay Shay, like we can't say things like, oh, kids just being kids. Yeah, your, your kid can just be a kid. Your kid can just be, you know, they, they could just be busting it up as a kid and also be racist. Yes, kids can be racist. Like, I don't understand why that was such a hard concept for us to grasp. Yes, people, boys will be boys. And also, you know, you, you could be a creep. Like, you know, kids can be kids. And also you could be a racist. That's the power of duality, right? We don't live in a dichotomous world where it has to be either or. Two things can exist at the same time. And I do believe that kids can be racist. Um, I've had experiences as a kid, like, experience, like dealing with the racism of other children. Yes, they were being kids. And also it was very much rooted in racism, right? Like, you know, hearing things like, uh, you know, things like you're pretty for a black girl that is rooted in racism, hearing things from other kids, like, you know, well, they, I, he didn't actually have the guts to tell me, but one of my best friends in childhood, I could no longer be friends with them. And I asked my parents like, what's going on with uh, so-and-so. And they're like, Oh, you can't play with them. Their grandma has a problem with black people. So they said that they can't play with y'all anymore. And they were very transparent about it. And very early experiences of racism. So I, I I know firsthand that kids can be kids and also be a little racist. So we're not going to sit here and sugarcoat and act like this is just her experience. And the reality is this goes back to me saying that not every platform is the platform for you to tell your story because the facilitator of that conversation, you have to have the, the capacity and to be able to understand the nuances of racism and what that looks like, even as children. Otherwise, you will valid, invalidate your uh, the, the person that you're interviewing. And we saw that with Club Shay Shay. Like I said, I like him, but I don't think that he was a person to have this conversation with um, because 
when you're when you're having these types of conversations it also may trigger your own experiences and somebody uh I, I was having a conversation with someone who works with athletes quite often and they were saying um a lot of times people like uh uncle shay shay or whatever they don't necessarily have the capacity to be able to talk about race because they it's not something that they feel like they experience because they've been applauded most of their lives for their performance for whether that's on the football field whether that's on the basketball uh court or whatever like when you are applauded by the world in general including black people white people asian people like whoever a, a part of you if you're not in tune you might start to forget that you experience racism too because that is not something that is you're constantly met with and as a result it does make um <clears throat> excuse me, it does make uh, sometimes people who are in that that vicinity, it makes it hard for them to be able to empathize with people who do talk about racism, who do experience racism on a day to day. We visibly saw her kind of like starting to tense up um, and she felt as though she was being challenged. Therefore, like when someone feels like they're being challenged, yes, I either challenge back or I do get defensive, um, which I feel like is a, a human, a very human, very much a human reaction. And uh, trust me, like when I say this, I want y'all to follow me. OK, I want you all to follow me. So Amanda Seals is someone who constantly speaks truth to power. She's constantly talking about issues happening globally, whether it's uh, what's happening in Gaza, what's happening uh, pertaining to like things happening in our own country, the protests happening on college campuses like this is going to talk about it. Right. If it has anything to do with racism, classism, like anything that impacts our people, she's going to talk about it when you have a platform like that. You get people who constantly challenge you, constantly uh, in your comments, in your DMs, wishing death on you, trying to challenge everything that you say. And when you do experience that on a day to day, yes, it does make you defensive. Like you feel like you have to constantly defend yourself. You feel like you have to constantly respond to every comment, respond to every video, respond to every like. And that's what we're seeing here. Right. And so I can say this because. I um, remember it was about a year ago, I had posted a video on like racism and psychology or whatever. Um, the video did, it did well, right? It, it did okay. And I noticed like the, a few days later, like it just started blowing up and I started getting all these hate comments. Like you need to go back to Africa, da, 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 da. Like it was just a lot of stuff. And I'm like, yo, we're, I guess this just ended up on the wrong side of Instagram today. And somebody like, shortly after somebody dm me a screenshot I was like hey girl amanda seals reposted your video mind you i didn't even see it. i didn't see that she uh but shout out to you girl thanks for being uh supportive um so she had reposted my video i'm like okay this makes sense i'm getting all these people who want to like come at somebody for talking about racism because they're coming from her platform and say so I, I say all that to say amanda seals literally has people who follow her who literally on, on social media, they follow her on social media just to combat her, just to uh, just to debunk the things that she's saying. And so when you're constantly putting yourself out there in the line of fire to spread this information and constantly being met with backlash by people who literally hate you on the internet, yes, uh, you, you do get defensive. And I think that we saw some of this defensiveness during the interview because it's like, I have to defend myself or I have to explain myself of racism and all this stuff like on a day to day. And I came into this interview having to do this even more like this is like supposed to be an interview i think that's where she was coming from so i just wanted to kind of explain that behavior just to give it more context because a lot of people were labeling her as being difficult combative like all these buzzwords that they like to label black women with anyway when in actuality this was her lived experience okay so another hot topic that i really wanted to dig into that was going viral um on this specific platform was the controversy about autism Right. There were so many things that we saw on the Internet related to autism, whether you need a ten thousand dollar evaluation, whether you need a diagnosis, whether you can self-diagnose, like a lot of different things were being brought up. And I want to address this all. So first things first, somebody. Well, let me just say this. So, again, I am a psychologist. I'm a clinical psychologist. Yes, I am able to diagnose individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And I have uh, I worked in a clinic as a neuropsychology uh, student. I was a student at the time, but I worked in a clinic for about a year. And at that clinic, I saw a lot of kids and 
we saw a lot of younger white children, a lot of them being younger white boys who were coming in to be tested for autism. They're going through a series of tests, then we score the test, and then we interpret the test in order to see, okay, whether or not this individual meets the criteria for autism spectrum disorder. So yes, that is true. We do utilize assessments and uh, measuring tools in order to diagnose with autism. But let me say this, I, I can't speak to how much uh, evaluation is in her area where she lives, but I will say it's very expensive. Where I was working, I I don't think that it was about 10,000. Um, but let me tell you, it is a battery. So when we say a battery, I'm not talking about one test that I'm giving you. I'm talking about like, it's about five or six tests that I'm giving you in an eight hour time frame in order to uh, assess autism. And so yes, it can get very expensive, especially depending on the measuring tools that you're utilizing. And so um, I hated doing them autism uh, tests. I hated it. It would take my entire day. Uh, but we're here now. We don't got to do them anymore. We graduated, period. Um, but yeah, so so th there is truth to what she's saying. It is very expensive. And the, the price varies from state to state, uh, wherever you're located. In areas on uh, in D.C., they're probably more expensive. In areas like L.A., probably a lot more expensive. Areas like, you know, the, the bigger cities, where you know, psych the cost of living is higher, yes, the, the test may be a bit more expensive. And let me just say this, uh, absolutely 100% agree with her regarding autism spectrum disorder not being properly diagnosed in black people in general. Literally had a post about that um, where I was talking about black kids. I, I don't think I posted it yet, but um, that is 100% facts. If y'all been following me for long enough, y'all know I say that a lot of mental health disorders that present uh, in, in people general in the general public one way, it may not always present in black people the same way. And the same goes for autism spectrum disorder. Black men, black women, we do not present the same way as our white counterparts when experiencing autism spectrum disorder. And this is one of the reasons why someone can go all the way from childhood all the way up into their 40s, not even being assessed for it or it being picked up by a teacher or a pediatrician or their therapist or what have you, because it presents so differently unless you have a culturally sensitive, culturally competent uh, psychologist, therapist, or whoever is working with that individual who can diagnose uh, assessing them. I was actually reading an article uh, for somebody that that wrote their experience of being diagnosed with autism, a black woman being diagnosed with autism later in life. And she was saying that she was always described as being self-sufficient. Uh, she could always watch herself for hours. People would describe her as being a child who could watch themselves for hours at a time without needing to play or interact with anyone or so mature that she could ma maintain her child, her school and bedtime routine without prompting or distraction. And the adults in her life called her responsible and a role model for others, right? So we're, we're seeing that this is a, a black girl exhibiting these characteristics, but later on in life, they find that the, the adherence to the schedule is not just them being responsible, but a symptom of autism spectrum disorder. Them being able to watch themselves for hours, not necessarily having to play with other people is not necessarily them being responsible or mature, but more so a, a proud autism spectrum disorder may present in a black girl, but not necessarily be diagnosed with, by um, a clinician because people aren't always aware of how these things present in black children and also uh because of the language that often we we utilize with black girls we're also we're often uh adultified so we're looked at as mature right we're often uh looked over and so we're seen as someone who's just um oh they're just following the rules they're just doing x y or z we're not necessarily we're going to be the ones to fall in the cracks when it comes to a, a diagnosis such as autism spectrum disorder and let's get into the self-diagnosis of it all uh because i i feel like a lot of people i made a few videos on tiktok about self-diagnosis and my thoughts on it and a lot of people don't agree with me in my perspective however i still stand 10 toes down in what i said um my belief system is this we're looking on tiktok and we're looking on instagram and we're saying like oh this person was diagnosed with depression disorder because they experienced x y or z or this person was diagnosed with anxiety because they experienced x y or z i now have that that's what i don't agree with right so i don't think that it is um responsible for a lot of us to uh, condone it and to say like, well, yeah, you can diagnose based on what you see on social media or whatever. I think that if you are going to be in a space where you uh, want to self-diagnose it, who am I to say that you can or can't? Because, you know, you can do anything in life or whatever. But I think that there comes a certain responsibility with doing the research, right? And it's, it's hard for Black people, especially Black women, because there's not a lot of research out there for us. And so um, what Amanda was saying is that she I, I listened to the interview myself. I didn't just look at the soundbite. 
she went through a series of symptoms and said, look, I meet the criteria for that. I meet the criteria for that. And I was listening. She was talking about the stimming or the, the stimulation. She was talking about the um, hypersensitivity to things. She was talking about the social issues. So it wasn't just a one and done thing. It wasn't just a, oh, I'm looking at this person on TikTok and they got it. So I might have it too. It was more so like a, look, I'm doing the thorough research and it looks like I meet the criteria. And um, if we're going to do self-diagnoses, I would encourage us to do the entire research and not just stop there, go about the like with it through with the what we call the collateral resources. So basically, um, she was saying like, oh, well, then my mom started doing research and she said I did all these things when we were younger. That's what we call a collateral resource. Someone who's able to kind of like see like how you were when you were younger, whether that was a parent or a teacher or a caregiver or whatever, your uh, grandma who used to take care of you when you were a child. Right. So like getting multiple multiple people in there to kind of like see what their perspective of things were also in addition to that if you find that you meet the criteria for autism spectrum disorder or any other type of disorder that you're um, attempting to self-diagnose or whatever i would also take that information to uh, a clinician like look i think that i meet the criteria for x y and z these are my symptoms I would like to know your thoughts. And we're not just saying any clinician, we're saying a culturally sensitive, culturally aware clinician because we know that we've been overlooked for so many years. Granted, um, if you're comfortable in, you know, just taking the diagnosis and whatever, that's that's your prerogative. But also there come there are some pros and cons to that because one of the cons is that um, a pro is that, yes, like if I'm diagnosed and I understand where these symptoms are coming from, it helps me to explain my own behaviors. It helps me to understand why I've been uh, disliked or why I have a hard time getting al along with people. A diagnosis, whether it's a self-diagnosis or a clinical diagnosis from an actual clinician, um, it can be validating in a sense. It helps to explain things for you. Uh, but also when we are diagnosing, when we are self-diagnosing, we also run the risk of what if it's not actually this disorder? What if it's a co-occurring disorder that actually goes with that, right? Or a diagnosis that is accompanying that. We oftentimes, we oftentimes finds that um, anxiety and depression are often co-occurring disorders. Uh, also, we have overlapping symptoms is what we call it. So sometimes when we have a diagnosis, we can see that one might present with symptoms in this way. So I feel as though I'm meeting the criteria for a uh, depressive disorder when in actuality, because of the co-occurring symptoms, I might actually be meeting the criteria for a bipolar disorder and might not be aware of it, right? That's just one of the um, cons of self-diagnosis. And so again, if we are out here um, self-diagnosing or whatever, I, I think that it, it's beneficial. It could be beneficial to take whatever information that we're gathering and the things that we um, found or whatever, the criteria that we feel we meet and take it to somebody, a trusted clinician to for further clarification, just to ensure that there aren't co-occurring disorders or overlapping symptoms is what we call it. Because I've had so many cases where symptoms were overlapping and it wasn't actually this thing, but it was actually this other thing. But because they overlap, you know, it makes it a lot more difficult. And so um, that's what I would say on that. I also want to say, I can't remember if I addressed it before, but I also want to address, um, do you need a assessment? Do you need an evaluation to actually be diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder? And again, I'm a psychologist. I was someone who did the assessments and the evaluations and diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. I diagnose others with autism spectrum disorder. And I'll say, if I have a client who is coming to me and they say, you know, the, the symptoms are clear, you don't need an evaluation. You don't need an assessment. We utilize assessments and evaluations when things are unclear. If we need, we call it diagnostic clarity. If diagnostic clarity is needed, then yes, we will refer you to get a uh, test or we would do the test ourselves or what have you. We would do the evaluation ourselves. However, and if you feel as though you meet the criteria for X, Y, or Z and you take that to the clinician and it's, it's clear, there isn't necessarily a need for a evaluation. So that is false. And I just wanted to address that, that we, people do not always, in every case, they don't always need an evaluation in order to be diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. So overall, those are my thoughts. Um, I do believe that this interview was able to spark a lot of conversations about autism, about racism in psychology, about uh, different things that we needed to have the conversations on. So I'm appreciative of that. And I want to know y'all's thoughts. So if you have any additional thoughts, if you agree or disagree with anything I said, I'm open to the dialogue. So make sure you put it in the comment section. And yeah, so make sure y'all tune in some more. You got the doctor in front of your neck.